replace or maybe even replace our trust in you. Father, there are people today that are struggling. There are people that are struggling with, with their health, with physical issues. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, your word tells us that Jesus bore in his own body our, our sicknesses, our diseases. He bore them on the cross where he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And what, as Second Peter tells us, that by his stripes we were healed. So, Father, we declare healing in the name of Jesus for those there are those struggling with cancer. We speak healing into their lives. That you would eradicate their bodies from cancer. There's the other that are struggling with other physical issues. Father, we ask and we are declaring healing over them today. Not by what we have done or what we can do. But Father, by, by what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. Father, there are people today that are struggling because of the loss of a loved one. God, you are the God of peace. As we saw in the Advent video that, that he, Jesus, is the Prince of Peace. And God, many people in the world think, well, you'll have peace, you'll have tranquility and peace in your heart when everything is set in order. Your son told us that his peace he lives, leaves with us, not as the world leaves or gives. That in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the loss, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of questions, your Holy Spirit brings us peace. So may your peace come upon those that are grieving today. We pray for, especially for Tom and, and Judah today as they are grieving the loss of his sister. Lord, we're thankful that we have the assurance that she, she knew you as her Savior. And God, right now, she is experiencing the, the presence of God. She is seeing her Savior face to face. And many ways, she's more alive than we are. But Father, the heart still hurts. Bring peace and comfort, I pray, to Tom and to Judy, to their family. So in the next couple of days, may you give wisdom, give insight. May they sense the loving arms of, of Jesus wrapping around them. Lord, that we look into your word. We ask that you give us eyes to see and a heart that would be open, ears that could hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And Father, we would be so careful to give you the praise, all the praise and all the glory. For we ask you these things in no other name, by the name of Jesus, and everyone said amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. I think almost like a wave of panic went over my, my mind when I heard Amanda say one week till Christmas. <laughs> How many have all the Christmas shopping done? Thank you. She says, no. Oh, you people that do. Uh, I tell you. <laughs> You're better than I am, I'll say that. But praise God. I'm thankful that uh, this year um, my kids, he, here's what my kids said. You know what kids can be. Dad, there's only $1,000 for this. You make lots of money. Am I the only one that's ever heard that? But my kid says something this time um, that was really unique. They said, already it's a better Christmas than it was last year. 
Amen. And I'm just, I'm thankful. That I want to get that out there. I'm thankful to the Lord that we, uh, our family will be together this Christmas. And uh, we're, we're really not taking that for granted. And I want you as, as a believer to cherish every single day with your loved ones, with your family. Because, uh, you know, all the gifts and all that is all great. The cards, the trees, I love the decorations. I, every day I come in and know, you know that they actually have two sets of lights on some of these decorations when they had the chapel airs here. So they would come on at nighttime and I look at the decoration, come in, sometimes praying here or in my office. I look and say, wow, it's beautiful. I love all the lights and everything. But the reality of it is I'm thankful more that Jesus sent his son for us. And we can have time with family. So I'm really thankful for that. So, so cherish the time for the, with your family. We will be having our Christmas Eve uh, candlelight service on, I think it's Saturday night, December 24th, obviously. Uh, so come, it's going to be a one-hour service. We have some great music, uh, sing some Christmas carols. Uh, for that, you really enjoy. I think the cafe will be open uh, on that night as well. Uh, just so you know, there will not be a Christmas Day morning service on Sunday. I know some of you are saying, not meeting on church on Sunday. But spend it with your family. Enjoy your family. I believe the Lord understands with that. So don't come here Christmas Day because you will be entertaining yourself. Because I will not be here. <laughs> Praise God. So we're thankful for that. Uh, so no Christmas service on Christmas Day, candlelight service. Uh, tonight is a special night uh, that we're going to be ha over at the Talbot Trail Park. Uh, 7 p.m., dress warmly. It is a little cold. Somebody came in this morning to the church and says, says they don't like winter. I'm like, we haven't even started yet. <laughs> and we're in the wrong country. We don't like winter. I, I'll be honest with you. I feel I was born in the wrong country because I don't like winter either. I don't like the cold. I like it for about two days and that's about it. But tonight, dress warmly. There's going to be Christmas carols singing in the park. My wife is going to be joining with me as well. I will be leading it. There will be coffee and hot chocolate. Bring your lawn chair. And can I emphasize again, dress warmly. Because uh, the heater is not working outside. Just saying. Uh, mailboxes. If you uh, have a mailbox, please check it. There are some Christmas cards and different things that are in there. If you do not have a mailbox or you are not sure you would like to have a mailbox as one of the ways we communicate back and forth with uh, people in the church, uh, you don't have to be a member to have a mailbox. Uh, if you want a mailbox, uh, see either myself or Pastor Ryan and we'll get there. Uh, at the mailbox, uh, there's a list of all the names of people that have a mailbox. If you look there, you do not see your name, please do not get offended. Just come and let us know and we'll put your name down there. We'll give you a mailbox. Amen. Amen. Just another quick uh, reminder. Uh, I went up to someone today and went to shake their hand that they want to shake hands. Uh, we are at that time of year uh, that we need to realize that some people will be comfortable at shaking hands. Other people will not be comfortable with shaking hands. So let's respect each other's own personal, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Boundary, space. Boundary, space. What, what do you hear over here? Again, comfort level, yes. So let's respect that and let's not be offended at that, but understand that some people, they, they, have, they either have a weak immune system, they know someone that does, uh, where that time of year they just want to wave, they want to give a high five, elbow, fist pump, or shake. But let's respect that, let's not, get, let's not worry about that, okay? Amen. Just want to throw that out there because it's that time of year and, and cold and flus and all that wonderful stuff is going around. Uh, if offering, uh, we don't take up an offering, but if you'd like to support the church, uh, we have our offering boxes at the back of the auditorium, and there's one in the uh, main office as well, and there are other ways that you can give online as well. I'm going to get you to take your Bibles. I think, I don't think I missed any announcements. No one is waving things at me or throwing things at me, uh, so that's good to there. Take your Bibles, and let's turn to Luke chapter 2. Uh, in a couple of moments, we're going to be starting at verse 8, going to verse 20. We'll get to there in a couple of moments. 
So Luke chapter 2, continuing in our series of Advent, and I wanted to do something just a little different this year rather than the usual, you know, talk about the shepherds and the wise men uh, and, you know, and the other ones that are part of the nativity set. And we have a beautiful nativity set that's here that was donated, and we have all the candles lit today because this is the last Sunday before we light the center candle, which represents Christ. This year, I wanted us to look at people that don't normally get the attention, people that we don't really have a story for, and kind of use some creative licensing without going out of the context of what the Word of God says and looking at how the Christmas story would affect their lives. So we were looking at the mother of Mary. We were looking at uh, the innkeeper and, and his, his family. Today, I want us to look at the shepherd's wife. And it's important to remember that the figurines that are part of our nativity sets and scenes that we enjoy every Christmas, they represent real people. They're not just characters in a story, um, but individuals whose lives were deeply impacted when they saw Jesus and witnessed his majesty that first Christmas. Can you imagine what it might have felt like, what it might have looked like to be there and witness the miracle of the Messiah coming. Like, I, I get goosebumps just thinking of it. And likewise, the lowly shepherds tending the sheep were not just some prop for a decorative uh, piece in our homes. Often when you see um, Christmas pageants and plays, you get little children that, that play shepherds. These people were real people with, with real lives, real families, and, and they experienced something that was very real. And for the shepherds who were present in this Christmas story, they told everyone that they crossed paths with, with the good news, what they witnessed firsthand. Understand, when these people experienced this miraculous birth of the Messiah. It changed and transformed their lives. I mean, they, they couldn't help but ex to express what they saw. They didn't want to keep it secret. And, and, and the shepherd's wife, oh, we didn't do the video. <laughs> Play the video. I knew I was missing something. He and I something. have a rhythm and a routine here in our humble home, and that morning he was messing it up. See, he comes in at 712 every morning on the nose. I hear his boots hit the floor. I make the coffee. He washes the pasture off of him, and we take our toast to the patio. That's our thing. He's a quiet man, likes the one word answers, that one. And then he's off to bed. He, um, he keeps the herd at night. Oh, how my parents looked at me when I told them that I'd fallen in love with a shepherd boy. <laughs> but um, that's a story for another time. Or never. But that morning, there were no boots. Only quiet. Quiet like my husband. And before I could get to the front door, it slammed. It was, it was loud. It was different. As if the front door knew something I didn't know. My husband yells for me. He yells for me. Maybe he's hurt. Maybe he's lost the herd. He's out of breath. He's saying my name as he takes my face in his big hands. He, his eyes, they're full of fear. No awe are running down his face and he can't stop talking, ranting about this bright light that fell out of the sky and angels, yes, that is what I said, angels, hundreds of them all over the field proclaiming good news. But what did he mean, good news? <laughs> now I know my husband, the shepherd, he will never hold the scepter of a king, never sit with dignitaries to solve the world's problems, never even be invited to a meal where he has to wear a suit. 
but he was given the greatest edict in all the land, all the world, actually, called to the front lines by God himself to proclaim this good news. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you that you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. I can say it in my sleep now. I can see it sometimes too. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. God was pleased with my husband, the shepherd. His boots hit the floor a little later on these days and that's okay because he is telling anyone who will listen the good news. Amen. Now, the shepherd's wife in the video that we saw recounted part of the good news found in this story that we are going to read. But let's take a moment and let's read it together. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 20. That says this. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel assured them, do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will, be, uh, will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, had been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find the baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth laying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others and the armies of heavens praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angel had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what happened when the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart. And thought about them often. Then the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. So, Father, may you add the blessing of the reading of your word to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. He, the shepherds told and kept telling the story of the good news that was worth sharing with everyone Everywhere. When a person witnesses the majesty of God, it's always a story that is worth telling. Actually, when God does something amazing or anything in a person's life, it's a story worth sharing with others. Each one of you here this morning have a story of what God has done for you. And God wants us to share our stories about how he has impacted our lives, influenced us, and changed our lives from the inside out. That was one of the reasons why I shared what we have gone through over the past several years so that you would see our, part of our story. Now there's more to that story. Because sometimes it, it can be a long story or a shorter story. And each one of us have a story of what God has done in our lives. And yes, we serve a story-loving and story-writing God. The writer of the book of Hebrews has something very interesting to say in the description of Jesus in correlation to our story. In Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 12, verse 2 said, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I love that phrase. 
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the author of your story. He is the one that is working in your life. And it is a story that he wants you to share with others. Have you ever really thought what it means for Jesus to be the author of your faith story? Do you realize that when that Jesus is authorizing your faith story so that he can receive all the glory for himself? I love Revelation. I've said this verse multiple times. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. See, you can argue doctrine. If you don't believe that, just look at how many churches are, are around the community. Each one has their own perspective and take on, on what some verses in the Bible would say. And I bet you if we would go around and, and give different doctrinal views from this audience, each one of us would have a different view of how we see things. And I'm okay with that. But you can't argue a story. Can't argue what God has done in someone's life. Because that is what he has done. That's what they have experienced and how they have seen God. And it is for the purpose of him receiving glory, not us. I would love to say that I was a part of my story and, you know, I did this or I did that. But I'll be honest with you, there was times where I, I, I was falling down. Where I needed the power of God to come into my life because I didn't think I was going to make it through another day. And I love the, the, how, how God meets us in those moments. And in those moments, it's like we say, God, you just can't hang on any longer. And then he says, well, then let go and let me hold you. Because we hang on to things in, in our lives so tightly, so tightly. And sometimes he wants to sit there and say, just let go and let me hold you. And that means that the ultimate, ultimately, your story is not so much about you. My story is not about me. Instead, it's about living a life that, that constantly points back to the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what we see the shepherds doing in the birth narrative of Jesus' story. They were telling their version of the story and what they saw, what they heard, what they witnessed that focused on Jesus. In other words, even though you have a, a main role in your story of your life, the true star of the script is the author and the perfecter of your faith story. So, Jesus, so if you're hoping to be a star in your own movie, sorry, you're not the star. Jesus is. John emphasizes this point in the gospel what, count when he said in John chapter 3, verse 30, he must become greater and I must become less. We focus so much on who we are. Can I just throw it out there? We are nothing without him. Absolutely Nothing. I don't care what education we have. I don't care what status in society we have. I don't care how, how much this or how much that we have we possess. We are absolutely nothing without him. And the believer that realizes that sooner is better off. Or as one person said, more of Jesus and less of me is a good thing. I don't want people to see me. I don't want people to look at me and say, wow, you, you're, you're such this or you're such that. I want them to look at me. And one of my prayers is when, when people see my life and they, they talk to me or they encounter me or we have a conversation, I want them to be able to, to as what the Bible says about the apostles. Remember what it says about them? They marvel that these men had been with Jesus. Now, th these guys who were with Jesus, they didn't have, you know, the, what's the um, Christian bling. 
Peter and them didn't have on the back of their donkey, you know, what would Jesus do? Tattooed. They didn't wear a, a, a cross on their, around their neck or didn't have a big 90-pound uh, Schofield Bible. They didn't have a mug that says, what would Jesus do? Or, but it says that they marveled that they had been with Jesus. They had met with Jesus. In other words, there was something in their lives that when people saw them, they said, you've been with Jesus. Even remember when Peter was denying Jesus that a young maiden woman came and said, you're with him, aren't you? You talk like him. You act like him. I've seen you with him. Let me ask this. If we were arrested today, if authorities came crashing in these doors, now if we're living in another country, that could be a very strong possibility. Be thankful for the freedom you have in our nation now. But if they were to come crashing in the door here and arrest every single one of us and haul us off to jail, would there be enough evidence against you to convict you as a believer? Think about that. I'm looking out and some of you are looking at, yeah, it would be some of you think, I'm not sure. Would there be enough evidence? I mean, if they were to do, have you seen what they do with people that are going to be in public office and, and the opposition, you know, don't want that person again, so let's dig up some dirt on this person. And if they were to go into our background and look at our lives and how we conduct ourselves, how we talk, how we live, how, how we speak, would there be enough evidence to say, yep, they're a believer. No question of doubt that they are a believer. Or would they sit there and say, we have to dismiss it because there's not enough evidence to prove they have a faith in this Jesus. That's a serious question. Because the Bible talks about how when Jesus comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's an interesting question. We must share our story. And one of the most effective ways to tell others about Jesus and the story of the gospel is to share your own story. And that's what the shepherds did in Luke 2. And as a result of sharing their story, it, it likely impacted their spouses, their family members that were close, and such as represented in this video we saw of the shepherd's wife in the video. And she in turn then told her story and how it impacted her husband, herself, and her relationship. Yet, these stories are powerful and have ways of impacting lives. And, and any good story has a beginning, a turning point, and then the conclusion. That leads somewhere in the response to a, the turning point. In our shepherd's story, the beginning was them out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night. The turning point was when the angel showed up with the good news of a great joy about a Savior being born, and then they are invited to see as he laid in a manger in the city of David. As they went and found the Christ child wrapped in swaddling cloths in a manger, they witnessed his majesty just as the angels told them they would. The conclusion led them to leave the manger while praising God and telling everyone this good news that had been shared with them. That was their story. They shared it freely and joyously because it was their personal experience. Let me ask this. How often do you share your story? How often do you share your faith? Yeah. Do you share your faith? Or do you simply go day after day, week after week, month after week, month, even year after year, never sharing who Jesus is to you and the story he has given you? Because each, every one of us have a story. You may not have to stand up, and God's not calling you to stand up with you, your 90-pound Schofield King James Bible preaching a three-point homiletically perfect sermon. But Jesus is calling us 
to share our story of what he has done in our lives. And people are watching you whether you think they are or not. I came to faith because of what I saw. Because I saw something change. As you consider the effective ways, I want this message today be more of an application to help you. Because each one of you are called to share your story. Some of you, it may, you may be afraid. You may be fearful. You might think, well, I can't do that. I'm not that type of person. Yes, you are. If you're a believer, you can share your story. As you consider different ways to share your faith story with others, Doug Fields in his resource of the greatest the second greatest story ever told suggests to organize your thoughts around three chapters of your story. So I'm going to teach you and tell you today how each and every one of us, regardless of how old you are, regardless of how young you are, regardless of whether you, what background theologically you come from, regardless of what your understanding of the word of God is, how you can share your faith and see people come to know Christ. Very simple. These three chapters will help you to, to remember and to retell your faith story repeatedly in your life. God desires you to be who you are and to share your story. And this is what they are. One, what was your life like before you became a Christ follower? So think back what you were like. What kind of person were you? What did you do? Would you dare tell anyone what you did? Secondly, how did you become a Christ follower? What were the steps that, that brought you to that place? And, and then thirdly, what has happened to you since you become a Christ follower? See, that's your story. What was life like before you became a Christ follower? What did you, how did you become a Christ follower? And what has happened in your life since that? That's your story. That's sharing the good news. That is what is known as evangelism. See, each and every one of us can evangelize. Evangelism is the spreading of the gospel, Christian gospel, by publicly preaching or personal witness. In other words, it's sharing your story of how you became a follower of Christ and what life was like before and after that decision. Evangelism is about investing in people relationally. Inviting them into a conversation about Jesus. And you can share your story in less than three minutes. I'm going to do, try and do mine in less than one. Start your clocks. Before I became a believer, I was filled with hatred, animosity, stress. I didn't like anyone. I didn't like anything. I saw in my mother. What caused me to come to know Christ was I saw in my mother, who was the same person, a change in her life. She was hateful, resentful, angry all the time. When she came to Christ, she had peace, joy, contentment, and she loved others. I wondered what she had because I did not have it. I came to Christ in that moment. God called me into ministry, and God also gave me the peace, the joy, and the comfort that I did not have in my life. That's what's happened since I became a believer. The hatred he took away. How do for time? No one checked. I could have gone on. I like how one guy says, Brian McLaren says this. Count your conversations and stay of your conversions. You never know what someone might need at that moment. What he means is this. According to the Bible, it is God who draws people to himself. It is God who does the saving. The, the name of Jesus means God saves. And that song we sang, my God, my Savior, it is God who saves. The angels told the shepherds to go to Bethlehem because a Savior had been born to save the world from their sins. I love what the book of Revelation says in Revelation 10, chapter 7, verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God. God still saves. In other words, it is God who is author, authoring your salvation story 
and he's authorizing it throughout the world. Not us. It's God who does the work. It's God's idea of the incarnation to happen in such a way that eventually would lead to the cross where Jesus would, would save the world from the sin that separate us from God. It's God who initiated that. We turned from God. And God, who, who did nothing wrong, initiates the plan of salvation. Jesus is the central part of the salvation story. However, God wants to write us into the script. He wants to partner with us. Isn't that amazing? God wants to contribute a verse of our lives. God wants us to have a speaking role in the faith stories of others who do not have a relationship with Jesus. As we have the opportunity to share our faith stories, just like the shepherds did. Remember those three chapters that I said earlier. What was your life like before you became a Christ follower? How did you become a Christ follower? And what's happened in your life since you become a Christ follower? Being able to remember those three chapters uh, in your story may help you stay focused when you have the opportunity to share it with others. God is calling us to do that. In fact, just remembering this simple question that Doug Field suggested when we organize our thoughts is before, how, since equals my faith story. Before, how, and since. That's my story. If you can remember that little equation when it comes to sharing your faith story, before plus how plus since, then you'll be on your way to sharing your story in an effective and personal way. God wants you to share your story. And when you share your faith story, sometimes people will listen. Sometimes people will be open. Other times people may not really respond at all. Regardless, remember we, what we read earlier in Revelation 7.10. The salvation belongs to our God. It is him who says, remember that what we need to be focused on when we're sharing the good news of Jesus to others. Count your conversation, not your conversion. The conversion, the conversation is your part. Leave the, the conversion up to the Holy Spirit. That's his part. We need to just be faithful in sharing our faith story. You, you can control that part of the things. You can't control how people will respond. You can't. I learned that early in ministry. I remember when I was young in ministry, I would preach my heart out. And it seemed that it just wasn't going nowhere. I remember my presbyter said, that's not your responsibility. You preach the word and leave the results up to him. But he wants us to share our story. Each one of us. You can't control how people respond. As you think about sharing your faith story with others, I, I keep going back to what Doug Fields wrote about the second greatest story. He encourages you to do these things and to advance, to advance the sharing of your story. You need to pray. We were talking earlier this morning before in between the worship practice and the service. And I don't know where you are in your faith walk. I don't know where you are in your prayer life. But years ago, the statistics were this, that the average believer prays three minutes a day, if that. Evangelical believer. I mean, I'm, I don't get me sitting down saying grace. That's a prayer, but it's really not. The average evangelical preacher, guess how much they pray? Someone throw a number out to see if you got it. About four minutes a day. And we wonder why our nation is in the situation that is in now. The preachers are not that much better than the average 
evangelical Christian. Three to four minutes a day. I, met, I remember when I was a brand new believer, I didn't, didn't know. I thought she was doing good until I actually realized that this person would read one verse of her Bible a week. I don't think she would finish reading her Bible if she lived to be 300 years old. We have to take our, our faith walk seriously. And please, please forgive me if I offend you. But I, I'm, I'm seeing in, 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 a, in a lot of believers that they don't pray and they don't read the word. I've sat with people, nobody from this church, but I've sat with people who are my age. And we would just, biblical stuff would just come up, talk about the Bible, and simple biblical doctrine. This is several years ago. My, my, my son Daniel was about 10, 11 years old. And we're talking about just simple Bible stuff, like anyone knew. And this person's looking at me like deer in the headlights, like, and I'm thinking to myself, don't you understand this is in the word? It is? My mind think I didn't say this to them. Maybe I should have. My 10-year-old has a deeper understanding of the Bible than you do. Folks, we need to get into the word. And, and, and the world has made us lazy. One of the things we said this morning, I don't, they got my phone back there. I have, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to digress it for a few moments, so bear with me. On my laptop, I have a program called Logos, and I have Olive Tree Bible. So I have probably about 5,000 books and commentaries and articles from these programs on, on this, right here. We live in a day and age where we can grab our smartphone and Google any preacher on the planet, I'm not talking about big ones that have got big names. If you want to know of, of Joe Smith in, I don't know, some way out place, because of COVID and because of the pandemic, most of the churches are online and you can see what they're doing. There's never been a time in, the, in history where the, the, the accessibility to the Word of God and biblical, good biblical teaching has been more readily available to us than it is today. But what I'm seeing, and again, please, I apologize if I offend you. What I'm seeing is that there's more biblical illiteracy in the church than ever before. My only conclusion is that we either don't care or we become lazy and apathetic. God has a story for us to share. And we need to pray. We need to be in the Word. We need to pray. We need to seek God's face. I guarantee you, I pray more than four minutes a day. <laughs> I pray like... Several hours at least every day. Wasn't always that case. But pray before you're talking to others about your story. Be sure to remember, ask God to help you organize your thoughts. Prepare your, your heart and the heart of the person you will be talking with and, and give you the confidence for you to share your story in a way that God can work through you. Next, you need to organize your thoughts. Before, how, and since. Before you begin to share your story, it's wise to take some time to think what it is you want to communicate when the opportunity arises. Those who take time to prepare beforehand and think through what they want to say, want to communicate, generally are more effective in communicating their story to others. Remember, organize your faith story. Remember before, how, and since. Maybe even write it out. Take time to write it out and go through it and maybe memorize it. And fourthly, watch your language. Now, I don't mean don't sit there, well, I'm not going to drop an F-bomb. 
But as you write your story, be sure to remember that you're talking to people who don't know churchy language. Or I like this one, Christianese, as some have called it. So be aware of using words that people who have not grown up in the church may know. For example, instead of saying, I've, I, I've asked Jesus into my heart, maybe say, I've asked Jesus to be in charge of my life. And then explain. Be sensitive and intentional about the language that you use in your writing down your story. If you cannot define the word that you are using, chances are the good that the person you're talking to will not understand what you mean. Keep it short, five minutes or less. Keep it short, simple, and clear. Practice it. Sharing your story should become second nature to you. Be ready to be able to share your story any time. And, and why shouldn't you? It's your story. Share it like a, a shepherd who had just witnessed his majesty with someone you cross path with within your everyday life. Every opportunity I get, sometimes my kids would just roll their eyes, but every opportunity I get, I share what God has done in our lives. And I, I have it down now that I can share our testimony. I did add the ministerial in less than five minutes. Talk about three years worth of what God has done in less than five minutes. And every single time I share it, it's not what I've done. It's what God has done. Every single time, people are like, wow, that's a miracle. To which I say, God still does miracles today. So let me close with this. What's your story? What has God done for you? See, your story may look completely different than mine. Maybe you don't have a story where you've had several family members that have brushed with death. Maybe you don't have that, and you don't need to have that. But what has God done for you? This is, we're ending 2022. Yeah, make sure I got the year right. Can I ask this? Can anyone lift their hand and say, God has shown himself to us, to me, in 2022? in a miraculous world. Let me see your hand. Okay, keep your hands up for a second. What, I'm not going to ask you, because we don't have time. What has he done? Think about that. What has he done for you? Has he healed you? Has he shown up and shown off? Has, has he provided for you financially? Has he provided for you in this or that? Are you aware that there's someone out there that if you pray and say, God, I want to share my story, he'll bring someone across your pathway that's still struggling with that, and they're going to look at you and say, wow, God did that for you? I have people that are calling me. They'll text me, they'll call me, they'll message me. They'll see me on the street and they'll say, I know what you went through. I know what you experienced and what God did for your family. Our family's going through this. Can you pray for us? See, you all have a story. I saw quite a few hands lifted up. You all have a story that you need to share. And like this shepherd who, who shared the news, and, and, and we're using a little creative licensing with the shepherd's wife. Yes, I know. But imagine how the shepherds coming home, how it would have impacted their family. Like imagine if you saw what they saw. You would just come and say, how's work? Ah, same old, same old. It would blow your mind if you experienced what they experienced. And you would be telling everyone everywhere. I can't shut up because of what God has done in our lives. Because it's so real. 
I want to encourage you to share your story. Pray about it. Between now and the end of the year, we don't have a whole lot of time. Pray and ask God to lead you to someone you can share what he has done for you in your life. Will you share your story with a person maybe this week? Ask God to open that door and maybe uh, the best present that you could ever give someone. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the story of the shepherds. And Father, how it must have impacted their lives. And as they went, and your word says that they went, they went away rejoicing and praising God. And we don't know all the details of their lives. We don't know exactly how it impacted every aspect of their life, their family, and how they looked at things. And maybe night after night after that, they would look up to the star and, and say, wow, I remember the day when. Father, you have given us a story to share. You've done things in our lives. Father, forgive us for the times that we just sit in silence. Maybe thinking someone else will. When we see someone that's maybe sitting there or standing there in line and, and, and we think we see them hurting and we can tell that, that they're hurting and we just stand there and say, well, it's not my place. Lord, may it be our place. May you stir our hearts. May we come out of our comfort zones. And Father, share with people the good news of the gospel of Christ, that he came. and It's not just what the Bible says, but, Father, the Bible has become, has become real in our lives because we have experienced it. And this is our story. Father, help us to do that. May we never forget what you've done for us. Lord, as we leave in a couple moments to go our separate ways, we pray that you would give us traveling mercies. Watch over us. Lord, may I ask, may I dare to ask, that each person in this auditorium this morning, those watching online, that you would draw someone to us this week that needs to hear the story of our lives, that need to hear the message of the gospel. Lord, as a church, we have gotten away from that. Forgive us. May we be focused again on sharing the gospel. Father, be with us. Watch over us until we come together again to meet. Keep us in your grace and your care and your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. May God bless you. Tonight, don't forget the concert in the park. Uh, dress warmly. Uh, and there will be hot chocolate and coffee. I believe that will be there as well. Christmas carol singing. It will be a great time for all bringing your lawn chairs. Uh, if you are visiting with us, if you fill out a connection card, that would be greatly appreciated. Watching us online, you could do the same thing. May you have a great day. If you need prayer, we're here. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, have a great day. God bless you. We'll see you next week or tonight.